Hi, good morning everyone. This is Adam Benzion from Hackster. Um, good to see everybody here on the uh, NXP uh, webinar. So, as you all know, um, you all registered to be part of the NXP um, uh, Flex Your Mind with Kinetis uh, Flex.io competition. And uh, this has been really fun. We have over 1,000 people that participate in the competition, generating over 700 ideas. Uh, and there's already actually nine really cool projects on, uh, on the system on Hackster. Uh, but we did get a bunch of really interesting questions from a lot of people, and we figured that we'll run a couple of more webinars, uh, which are really aimed at answering any questions you might have as you have received your board um, uh, from Hackster uh, via NXP. And uh, really, if you have any questions about your development needs and whatsoever, we're here to answer. So uh, back with us today is uh, Danny Garcia from NXP, who is going to, again, provide us with more useful general information about the Kinetis board, about your development environment. And I will moderate um, the conversation through um, the chat uh, box that you have right here on uh, GoToWebinar. Uh, so feel free to ask me questions. I'll see there's one first questions come in, came in, and I will uh, make sure that uh, Donnie gets them and we answer them uh, on time. But otherwise, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over the, the presentation mode to Donnie to go over uh, and tell you guys a little bit more about the, the Kinetis board and everything else you need to know to build your project. Without further ado, uh, Donnie, uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Adam, and a big thank you to the Hackster team uh, for the hosting the contest. and. Really, we wanted to consolidate some information and also open it up to your questions. So we're, we're open to your questions and we want to hear them. So as I go through this content, uh, please enter your questions and we'll have plenty of time at the end of the session to look at your questions and try and address them. So for our agenda today, we're going to give a summary of the Flexio peripheral. We're going to talk about some additional resources uh, that are out there on NXP.com, our Flex.io application notes, and then talk about uh, the software and tools we have for the Freedom KD2F. And then uh, we'll close out with some uh, FAQs and known issues we have with the Freedom KD2 board. So thank you for joining, and uh, we really hope that this is all the information uh, you need to really uh, get to the end of this contest and to, to make your submission and to, uh, you know, participate in this contest. <clears throat> so what is the Flex.io? Whether you uh, are new to the contest or you, you've just started looking at your board, uh, we wanted to recap uh, what this Flex.io peripheral is. And so uh, Flex.io is a smart peripheral. And so uh, as a peripheral, it goes in a microcontroller in a system on chip, and it implements a wide variety of functions uh, related to the inputs and outputs of the chip. And so uh, it's not just a standard peripheral, though. It is a, a smart peripheral. And what this means is uh, the data that it uh, handles, it can do it in intelligent ways. So just like uh, we're bringing intelligence to our homes, with smart thermostats or intelligence to our bodies with smart wearables or intelligence to our cities uh, and infrastructure, uh, we have this intelligence built into this peripheral. Uh, and the goal of this peripheral is to change raw data. So this is data coming into the chip, into valuable data and reactions. And so uh, what you can use the Flex.io for is really uh, quite flexible, hence the name Flex.io. And so if you look at our enablements, our application note, our uh, drivers and software, you'll see that uh, the Flex.io can be used to generate PWMs, to emulate I2S, I2C spy communication. It also can be used to create a new or incremental interface. So on my controllers, generally, uh, the more expensive, the larger memory size my controllers they have more advanced peripherals for HMI, whether it be camera or display. Uh, but the unique thing about Flex.io is because it's a peripheral that can be uh, manipulated or changed to do different functions, you can get this uh, peripheral on a, a low flash memory size MCU with a Cortex-M0 plus core or a Cortex-M4 core, 
and have the ability to interface to a camera or to an RGB display. And so part of what the Flex.io is and what it can be used for is that it can emulate uh, these incremental interfaces, whether it be camera or display or microphone interfaces. And the unique thing about it is that it can do this on a wide range of uh, MCU uh, points. So Flex.io, uh, this contest with Hackster is uh, built on the Freedom K82F board, uh, but Flex.io peripheral itself is on a number of Kinetis MCUs. And so whether it be uh, Cortex-M0 MCUs with smaller flash memory size, uh, targeting 8-bit replacement, or, or targeting ease of use, uh, real simple controllers, we have a version of Flex.io on those type of controllers. And we also have a version of Flex.io that uh, is on newer controllers like the KD2F. And so uh, the point is that uh, the Flex.io is, is unique in that it's software configurable. And so generally when you have a peripheral, whether it be a SPI or I2C, it's set to do one function. Uh, but the Flex.io can be set with software to do many functions. Uh, and then on top of that, it can do things to offload uh, the CPU. And so we have match and pattern recognition built into the Flex.io peripheral, where as the data comes in, uh, you can look at this data and make uh, additional actions based on uh, the, if the data matches a certain pattern uh, or you can even count uh, patterns as they come in. And so uh, the, the last circle here about Flex.io is uh, that it can be uh, improve your energy efficiency. So the Flex.io uh, being a smart peripheral is asynchronous. And so this means it can be clocked independently of the processor. And the advantage of that is there's modes of a microcontroller where you can continue to clock this peripheral and, and get it to operate. And so, you know, just to recap, uh, Flex.io is a smart peripheral. Uh, it can emulate all sorts of functions. Uh, it can be used to create newer incremental interfaces. It can be used to add additional interfaces uh, for uh, SPI or I2C. And it's, it's different in that it can uh, do intelligent functions, do pattern recognition, uh, and uh, the bottom uh, right of this slide goes into the structure or the attributes of the Flex.io. And uh, this flexible peripheral is built from input and output pins, timers and shifters, triggers, uh, state machine, and logical operators. And so as data comes in, you need to uh, time that data and to store that data in this peripheral. And that's what the, how the timers and shifters work. Uh, to accomplish this, these tasks. And then the intelligence part of the Flex.io, what makes it smart, is that it can do state machine functions or logical operations based on this data as it comes in. And so getting back to the Flex.io, why the, this contest with Hackster, uh, why is it built from the Freedom KD2F? How does it re relate to the Freedom Board? So firstly, the Freedom Board is NXP's uh, development platform for Kinetis MCUs. So this is uh, Arduino form factor board that allows expansion with partner modules. Uh, you can connect uh, additional sensors and so on. So it was, uh, for one, one point is that this Freedom Board is just our platform uh, for uh, development on the Kinetis MCUs. Uh, like I said before, Flex.io actually is available on a number of chips, but why did we choose the Freedom KD2F? Why this specific board? And so what it comes down to is uh, for Internet of Things applications, there are many, uh, many challenges. You know, handling input and output of data is one aspect of addressing IoT applications. Uh, but there's other aspects of generating uh, a lot of data where, where do you uh, place this data? How do you store it? Well, the Freedom KD2F comes with 32 megabits of serial NOR flash that allows you to store this data. And with IoT applications, 
uh, you also have the challenge of uh, securing your design. And so there's cryptographic accelerators on this chip. So we really chose sort of the superset uh, Kinetis MCU that the Kinetis MCU that had the most capability in terms of Cortex M4 for DSP processing, uh, memory expansion with serial NOR flash security. And so this is how uh, this, this choice of the Freedom KD2F came about, is uh, we wanted to highlight the Flex IO as a uh, smart peripheral to uh, make smart things. And we also wanted to give you a, a nice platform. Uh, so all of those of you who have uh, submitted your idea and you, you've gotten aboard, you've really gotten a nice platform for your development of uh, any type of application, but specifically meeting the challenges of security, of memory expansion, of low power. And so we really uh, are glad that you've participated in this contest and have this platform now uh, to innovate on. So thanks again for the hundreds of people who are getting these boards and all the ideas uh, that have been submitted. And just to emphasize uh, what the Freedom KD2F board is and how it relates to this contest, uh, here's a nice diagram of all the, the aspects of this board. The KD2 is uh, MCU that has full speed USB. So you can see at the top uh, we have two uh, micro USB connectors. One goes directly to the MCU and the other is used for the debug port. Uh, I talked about the need for data storage and memory expansion and you can see we have a great deal of memory uh, delivered by two 32 megabit serial flash uh, devices. And here you can get up to eight megabytes of memory storage. And then we have uh, the headers on the left and the right of the board. Uh, these are to fit the Arduino form factor to allow expansion. We have many headers on this board for RF expansion. Uh, and we have some touch pads for HMI. And relevant to this contest, we have a Flex.io camera header, uh, but can be repurposed uh, for a camera or for uh, leveraging the Flex.io and connecting to other boards in this, in, to, to this Freedom KD2F board. And uh, in terms of sensors, we have an accelerometer, a magnetometer, an RGB LED. So this is just again to emphasize, uh, we wanted to highlight this peripheral with this contest and we chose a, a very uh, complete uh, MCU and Freedom Board platform uh, to allow you to innovate on and to uh, participate in this contest. So whether uh, you're, you're just getting started or you're marching towards that March 30, uh, May 30, 31st date to submit your final idea, we hope that you make use of this uh, very sufficient board here. So there's been a, a lot of questions about, well, you know, we've shown some examples and we have some pre-built examples in our Kinetis SDK uh, and we've highlighted these, but what if I want to do something uh, more advanced or what if I want to learn more about where the camera data is going uh, and how it's being uh, accessed by the Flex IO? And we want to highlight to you these uh, application notes. So uh, these application notes are all posted online on nxp.com. Uh, you can go and uh, search by these application note numbers and many of them come with software. So the software uh, can be downloaded and, and can be uh, utilized with the Flexile peripheral. Uh, but really relevant to some of the questions we've gotten is that these application notes don't give a simple example, they actually go in and talk about uh, why the Flex.io is set up a certain way and where the data is going and how it's uh, being accessed. And so if you have some questions about uh, more in-depth questions, some of these application notes may be able to address your questions uh, and you can go in and see, uh, for example, using the Flex.io for par parallel camera interface, uh, you can get uh, more in-depth information. And I want to highlight um, how you access these application notes. So the previous slide has links, uh, but if you're at your computer now and you're watching this webinar 
and you want to uh, look at these application notes, uh, the, I, I, I advise just going to NXP.com and searching for the application note number. And so if you take uh, AN 5133 and put it into our search engine, uh, you will see that uh, hardware and software enablement uh, be uh, presented to you. And uh, the software, it's uh, sometimes not highlighted uh, in, in very well. So this methodology for searching for the application note allows you an easy way to access the software. And so you can see that uh, if you search for AN5280, you will get a result that uh, highlights the application note itself. So this will be the document, you see it here on the bottom right, that goes into in-depth the hardware and software uh, configurations used to, to do a certain flex IO function. In this case, it's driving an RGB LCD. Uh, but when you do this search, you'll also see an associated file. And if you look at the slide at the bottom left, you can see AN5280 software. And so this is important because uh, uh, going along with this hardware and this application note is an example software uh, package that, that allows you to really implement this uh, FlexIO uh, application. So again, uh, you know, we know that uh, the FlexIO, there's some, some questions about, well, how do, how do I really understand how, where the camera data is going, or can I see more examples? And we wanted to highlight these application notes, and we hope they can be useful. And just to give you a, a picture of some of the information uh, that will be in the application notes, uh, specifically for the camera, the camera uh, demonstrations are built from a CMOS sensor. Uh, it's a module delivered by Omnivision, and so this CMOS sensor has a specification for how the data needs to be uh, accessed, how the 8-bit RGB data needs to be accessed. And so on the left, you see a diagram of uh, how this is being done with the uh, FlexIO data pins, D0 through D7, and what signals need to be generated by the FlexIO. And on the right, you see uh, a diagram of the system workflow. So this is showing uh, a diagram of as the data comes in these eight data pins, uh, where the data goes into the shifters, uh, and then uh, how DMA is used to move this camera data into our SRAM block. And so the point here is if you have some more in-depth questions, if it's about a specific uh, topic as was shown for the application note, uh, definitely go to these application notes and see uh, how those can assist you in your Flex I.O. design. So also we wanted to uh, highlight, you know, once you receive your board, where do you start? And a, a great place is the webinars hosted by Hackster uh, on that, the website uh, related to this contest. Uh, and webinar two specifically talks about uh, where to start. And so uh, to, to recap some of the information there, uh, you know, to work with the board, you need a soft, software development kit. And for NXP and Kinetis, uh, this is the Kinetis software development kit. And we have a, a web link here on the top, uh, www.nxp.com slash ksdk. And here you can start uh, and, and get a download uh, of your uh, of the Kinetis SDK, which has all of the pre-built examples uh, that you can start from. And so, if you want to add FlexIO to your design, uh, definitely you have to start here with the Kinetis SDK. Uh, and uh, here's uh, some important links and a link to the webinar too, uh, which sort of uh, walks through the steps, each step in getting this downloaded on your PC accessing it and uh, using uh, the examples that are built in there. And so for our technology forum, which is coming up, we intend to have more classes and more recordings. Uh, so as time goes on, uh, whether you, you make the deadline for this contest or you want to develop additional designs after this contest, uh, expect to see more uh, training and more webinars posted on nxp.com uh, 
based on our technology forum coming up here in May. And so uh, there's some essential links that we want to highlight to you. Uh, and some of these are posted on Hackster. Uh, some of these are, uh, this is pulled from the webinar too. And so there's uh, links to the Kinetics community page, uh, our software enablement for uh, touch sensors uh, to the, the Grove ISPRT touch sensor, which was used in webinar two. Uh, we have uh, partner tools. Uh, from Sager and so on, the reference manual. So once you get the KS SDK, this is a nice uh, set of links uh, to get you uh, more information. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of information is posted uh, there, uh, but if uh, you want some uh, direction and some links, definitely uh, reference the webinars and, and reference these links here, which are essential uh, to, to getting uh, the functions that we've done in the webinar uh, and demonstrated in the webinar, being able to do them, you will, you will need these links. And so just to recap, uh, you know, you, you, you receive your board, uh, this, this very nice board with the, the Freedom K2F, and uh, you want to start with the Kines SDK and the webinars, and, and these essential links will help you uh, walk through those webinars. So uh, on to uh, what uh, uh, we, we know a lot of users have experienced. And so the Freedom KD2F board uh, has issues with Windows 10. Uh, and so um, whether uh, maybe you've experienced this, uh, and, and if you have, I hope to give you some guidelines or some information to help you deal with this uh, issue. It's a very critical issue. So it uh, has a big impact, uh, but uh, we've nailed it down uh, to Windows 10. So if you have uh, the ability to not use Windows 10, uh, that is, that is the, the best advice uh, in the near term until you reprofile the board, which I will go over. Uh, and so what it comes down to is Windows 10 is affecting our uh, open SDA. So, a bit about OpenSDA and how this relates to a Freedom Board. So on the Freedom Board, we want this to be an easy to use development platform. And the, the way we do that is we include, with every Freedom Board, we include a incremental IC, an incremental chip, uh, that is uh, managing a, the debug. And uh, this is essentially a debug pod or a debug tool that comes on your board. And uh, if you look at the arrow on the right, you can see uh, it's pointing to a, an incremental chip on this board. And this is a, a K20, a Kinesis K20. Uh, and this debug, uh, this MCU is running, hosting the debug application. And uh, the open SDA is uh, really the open debugger uh, environment that facilitates this. And how this works is on this uh, incremental IC, uh, the K20, uh, there is a, a bootloader placed on this chip. And this bootloader allows this chip to be profiled to be a PE debug tool. PE is uh, a third party who makes debug tools, a Sager debug tool, a JLink, or a CMSYS DAP, which is a uh, ARM embed uh, profile. And so, couple of things is this chip, uh, it depends on a bootloader, uh, so that way you can change these different profiles, uh, and then it hosts the debug application. It emulates a debug pod, uh, and so this is an essential piece. And so what is happening on our boards is when you uh, use Windows 10, it is affecting this bootloader in, in a way that is making the board uh, unusable. And so I'm going to go through some steps. Uh, some uh, steps to prepare the board so that way it can be used with Windows 10, and then some steps uh, in order to uh, resolve the issues once you've used Windows 10. And so this is important information that you need to know uh, if you are facing uh, some challenges with these boards. And there's a link here uh, on the bottom left to learn more about OpenSDA. <clears throat> So uh, the first workaround uh, that we want to talk about is uh, changing 
from the CMSYS DAP to Sager J-Link profile. And so uh, when the board is shipped to you, it is shipped with a certain debug profile. So again, uh, you have the K20 IC, which is hosting the debug profile, and it contains a bootloader. And so using this bootloader, you can change from a CMSYS DAP profile to a Sager J-Link profile. Uh, and so if you uh, absolutely have to use Windows 10, uh, the means to do this is when you first get your board, before you connect the board to Windows 10 or before you're facing any issues, uh, you can change this uh, debugger profile from CMSYS DAP to Sager J-Link. And the way this is done is uh, on Sager.com, uh, there's an open SDA binary that is uh, hosted there. If you go to that link on the left and you scroll to the bottom of the page, you can download this uh, and, and uh, this, is, this file is needed because this is going to be the binary that goes into the debugger uh, IC, the K20, uh, and uh, reprofile it from being a CMSYS DAP to a Sager J-Link. And so uh, the actions in order to do this are documented in Getting Started for Kinetis SDK, uh, a document that uh, we talked about in the webinar too, uh, but it's, it's quite straightforward. So there is a reset button uh, and the USB port that is connected to the debugger IC, the K20. And so uh, how you reprofile this is you hold down the reset button, you plug in the USB cable, and you will see that uh, the board will enumerate as a, a bootloader. And so here's some uh, incremental pictures uh, to show uh, how, what this will look like. And so on the bottom left, you can see uh, the computer, uh, the folders uh, in the computer, and you can see that there is a folder uh, that is a designated bootloader. This happens when you hold down the reset and plug in the USB cable. And then taking that file that you download from Sager, uh, you can just drag and drop into this bootloader uh, folder. And so once you drag and drop this file into the bootloader folder, it will uh, pro reprofile the K20 uh, IC, which is emulating the debug tool. And the impact of this uh, that you, you need to know is, uh, is that now, instead of being a CMSYS DAP, uh, debugger, it's going to be a Sager J-Link debugger. And so if you're using Kinetis uh, Design Studio KDS, uh, you can see the window on the right. Uh, this is just highlighting that uh, you would have to use uh, the Sager J-Link debugging profile uh, that in order to, to leverage the Kinetis SDK. So it's different for different integrated development environments. So if you're using uh, KDS. This is a nice picture that shows, uh, highlights what you need to do to your projects when you when you uh, attempt to download your firmware. You will have to ensure that you're using the pow the right uh, debugger profile for IR. It'll look a little different, uh, but the point is is highlighting the impact. So once you make this change, uh, all the projects in Kinetis Design Studio, I'm sorry, in Kinetis Software Development Kit. They were done uh, generally using the CMSYS DAP profile because this is what we were shipping with the board. But once you reprofile this to be a different type of debugger, you need to go into your debugger and uh, change the target uh, debug settings so that it knows it's working with the J-Link now. So uh, just to recap, uh, a, uh, if you have to use Windows 10, uh, or if you want to reprofile your board to be a J-Link, uh, this is a path to avoid issues uh, with the board. You can um, download the file, hold the reset pin, plug in the USB cable, drag and drop the file, uh, and then you need to know that your projects, when you go to debug, you have to tell, set the debug settings that you're now using a J-Link instead of a CMSYS DAP uh, debugger pod. So, that's one path uh, for resolving the board issues. Uh, there are also uh, the, the case, there's the case where uh, using Windows 10, your board has become, become unresponsive. 
And so there are workarounds for this as well. Uh, this is not an easy workaround, but I want to overview uh, what can be done, one, one method that can be utilized uh, to, to uh, resolve this issue with these boards. And so uh, the first thing is that you need a, a J-Link tool. And so there are J-Link light tools. Uh, they range in cost from $30 to $60, or you may already have this type of tool uh, around you. Uh, and so uh, you will need this tool in order to connect to the K20 device that is on this board. You need to, the second step is you need to download and install some J-Link software. And so again, you can go to this site hosted by Sager uh, and you can download a software and documentation pack. And uh, this is the software that's going to provide you the drivers for the J-Link Lite tool, uh, but also give you a uh, executable application uh, to allow you to interface to the K20 that is on this board. So uh, just to, to re-emphasize, if, if you aren't using Windows 10, we don't expect you to have any issues with the board. If you have used Windows 10, uh, it, takes, it sometimes takes multiple iterations to corrupt uh, the board, so maybe uh, you, you have not corrupted your board yet. Uh, definitely follow the steps on the previous slide to change your profile to a J-Link profile to avoid any issues. But if you have corrupted your board, now you have to uh, implement these steps and it requires some additional hardware and some additional software and some additional steps that I'm going to go through. So uh, once you download the Sager J-Link software, uh, you will see that uh, there is uh, this folder uh, installed. You, you have to install this application software from Sager, and you'll see a folder like what is shown on the left. And here there will be an application for uh, J-Link. Uh, and uh, you also need a binary file. Uh, this is the binary file is for the K20 uh, board that is uh, on the device emulating the debugger. It is to reprogram the bootloader of uh, this K20. And so uh, there's a OpenSDA debug port. Uh, the arrow is a little off in this slide, but if you look right below the arrow, you'll see that there is a, a debug port there. And whether you have uh, the 20 pin or 10 pin, uh, JTAG header, uh, I'm sorry, JTAG connector, you can make this work as long as you align pin 1 to pin 1 of this header. And this is the header, this is the JTAG port that goes directly to the K20. Uh, and uh, this is what needs to be accessed and used to reprogram the OpenSDA bootloader that is on the K20. So if you double click that JLink application, it will open up uh, a command interface and there are a number of commands uh, that need to be uh, uh, implemented. And uh, I'll go through these. So you open up the command window. Uh, you will have to say, type in the command connect. Uh, and when you type in the command connect, it will uh, ask the question about which device to connect to. And you have to connect to the MK20DX128 uh, XXX5, and this is uh, giving the, the J-Link command tool the information about what chip uh, it is going to access. And then uh, you have the choice between JTAG and SWD. You can just type S uh, to do a single wire debug. Uh, I'm sorry, serial wire debug, not single wire, serial wire debug. But either way, uh, the point is, is this is the list of commands that uh, you need to type out into this command window uh, once you have your uh, board powered and you have the connector there uh, and this will allow you to access the firmware uh, on the uh, Freedom K2F board that needs to be updated. So uh, we have embedded flash on the K20 and so the first command after you are connected is erase. So you want to erase uh, the firmware that is on the K20. Uh, and then the, the last command here is uh, to load the binary uh, that is the uh, 
open SDA bootloader uh, that, uh, and it needs to be loaded in, into the, the start of the memory map, uh, which is at hex zero. So, uh, you know, you, you have to download this uh, Sager uh, J-Link firmware and use this executable and use these handful of commands, uh, but altogether the purpose of this is to correct uh, corruption of our uh, bootloader uh, that uh, happens when you use our board with Windows 10. And so there's a number of steps here. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, a, not a, a um, simple process, but after you do this, it will place the board back into the state it was uh, when you uh, first received it. And then uh, in order to uh, make sure that the board uh, is um, usable, uh, you want to re revisit some of the, the, the instructions given on the slide 10 of this webinar. So uh, this is, uh, if, you, if you're going to use Windows 10, uh, you need to go in and uh, reprofile the board to be uh, a, a Sager J-Link tool. And so those steps that uh, were, were given starting on slide 10 uh, need to be re revisited uh, and to, to, uh, in order to use the board uh, after doing this, uh, these steps to reprogram the, the bootloader. So very important, out of the box, the Freedom K2F does not work with Windows 10. So if you have the option to not use Windows 10, uh, that, that is a, a, uh, a, uh, an option. If you, if you have to use Windows 10, follow the steps on the, the slide 10 of this webinar, and you'll, you can go through and reprofile the board very easily with no additional hardware uh, or um, just some simple steps on, on reprofiling the board. The impact is that you need to know that when you use your integrated development environments, you have to change the debug settings. If you have used Windows 10 and your board is not responsive, uh, the open SDA bootloader can be reprogrammed. Uh, you need incremental hardware and software in order to do this and follow the steps uh, given on this webinar uh, as a guideline, uh, but definitely, uh, you know, if you, if you haven't gotten started and you can avoid uh, this issue, that, that's the best path. And, uh, you know, getting past the board issues will allow you to innovate with the FlexIO peripheral. As I said at the beginning of this webinar, the Freedom KD2F is a, a very sufficient platform. Uh, we hope that, uh, you know, you're, you're hard at work getting your entries in so we can uh, Hackster can evaluate them and you can be part of this contest and I really wish you luck. And so uh, I'm going to end it there so we can uh, take questions and see uh, if there's any other topics we can cover uh, for the rest of this hour. Awesome. Thank you, Donnie. Um, okay, so we have actually our first question and everybody on the call, please, please feel free to type in your questions and I will convey them to uh, Donnie. Uh, so the first question is from uh, uh, Saeed, and it is, how do we add a wireless connectivity to the Freedom Board? Are plug-and-play Bluetooth or Wi-Fi modules available? So um, for modules, there are uh, connectors on the Freedom KD2F that work well with uh, standard serial modules, whether it be UART or SPY uh, out there. So uh, in, the, in the near term, there's Wi-Fi modules that plug into the, the Freedom Board. Let me go to a picture to, to try and emphasize this. So you can see here on the uh, left corner, there's a, um, be, behind the text uh, K2 USB micro, there's a uh, four pin header for connect, expanding to uh, a spy board. Uh, that can be Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. Uh, and then we also have on the bottom right another standard header. So uh, I, I didn't come prepared with a list of modules that uh, work well with this board, but that would be a, a, a good uh, a good list. So maybe we can follow up with uh, a uh, post or or some more information about what modules fit into these standard headers, whether it be uh, the standard uh, header here on the left or uh, on the bottom right. 
And, and so uh, definitely we built uh, the board with expandability in mind. Uh, it's Arduino form factor compatible. So if there's a Wi-Fi shield uh, out there, uh, that, that will work as well. But on top of that, we have these other standard headers that work well with uh, partner boards out there. Great. Thanks, Donnie. Um, does anybody else have uh, any other uh, questions? Uh, actually, that was the only question typed in. So again, feel free to ask any question whatsoever. This is an amazing opportunity to learn about this board and uh, about the environment that you are developing your project in. Uh, so go ahead and type it in, and uh, I'll convey it to Donna. Hi, Adam and Donnie. This is Kathleen with, with NXP. I, I do see a, a couple other questions. Um, one is, why use version 1.3 versus version 2 for the SDK? So um, we have two versions of the Kness SDK supporting the KD2F. And uh, the reason you would use uh, 1.3 would be uh, if your starting point uh, has uh, code already in that version of SDK. A good example is many of those application notes that I highlighted, they were done uh, before the Kness SDK 2.0 was available. So if you look at some of those ap application notes and decide that, hey, this is uh, where I want to start from, uh, then that would be a good reason to use Kness SDK 1.3. But in general, uh, my advice is to use the latest SDK um, and uh, to see about leveraging uh, that uh, SDK just because, uh, as with in all versioning, the latest version is uh, the most up-to-date, uh, has the most uh, embedded software already there, and, and will be what we build from in the future. So uh, to answer the question, the reason to use the Kness SDK 1.3 would be uh, what, where you're starting from in terms of a, an example project that may force you there, uh, and, and that would be the main reason. And since you mentioned the app notes, Donnie, let me, let me ask this one, which is that some of the app notes software source files um, in the dot, um, execute file, um, they can't be used under Linux which is this person's development machine. Is there another way or a different way that they could get access to the source? Okay, so uh, that's a good question. So um, I don't have a lot of familiarity developing in Linux, uh, and so I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I think that uh, if possible, uh, if you could, uh, you know, access the source on a Windows machine and then just send the relevant files over, I think that would be uh, probably the, the most straightforward path. Uh, but uh, I, I really, I don't have a lot of experience uh, developing on, on a Linux machine, so don't have a good answer for you there. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm, I apologize, by the way, earlier I couldn't see all the questions. They're back on my screen. There's another uh, a good question. Does the Freedom Board support Seed Studio uh, Groove uh, Arduino Shield and sensors? Uh, is, if you're familiar with that kit, um, that come with those plug-and-play um, sensors? Yes, definitely. And on the webinar, too, we, we showed an example of expanding with that uh, Grove board uh, and uh, using a I2C touch sensor. And if you look at one of the projects that is posted, uh, that is uh, submitted now, uh, you can see that we, uh, a, a picture of this emulating a access, uh, a door, a smart uh, access door uh, knob. And so definitely uh, we have expansion through, through any Arduino form factor uh, expansion board. And uh, it works really well with the, the C Studio boards and the great thing about uh, those boards is that the interfaces are quite flexible. Uh, and uh, what we highlighted in our webinar, too, is even if the board itself is built to be a UART interface, uh, you can actually plug in an I2C sensor there because of the flexibility of the 
flex IO. So the same pins that do UART can be I squared C. And so uh, we, we have a, a project that's built up and is posted there. And uh, uh, definitely uh, with the software that's posted around the sensors for uh, the, the Grove, uh, that, that's a, a, good, um, a good path to adding sensing uh, to your Flex.io application. Great. Um, give me one second. There's another question about the uh, SDK. Um, why, is it, why use version 1.3 versus 2.0 for the SDK? Yeah, so I, I would say um, if it depends on where you're starting from. So if you're starting from the SDK uh, 1.3 or application note, uh, that leverages the SDK 1.3. What I have shown on the screen right now, uh, a lot of these application notes were done uh, before the SDK 2.0 came. So it depends on timelines. Uh, like I said before, uh, SDK 1.3, it has uh, a lot of support. It has uh, these, uh, many of these application notes use that. Uh, and the, the reason to use it would be if you were leveraging, for example, the graphical LCD, I, I know uh, this software is built from the KSDK 1.3. So both are available for the KD2F. We highlighted how to use and download the 2.0, but the same paths can be uh, done for the 1.3. So um, maybe to summarize, 1.3 has been a long, has been around longer. And so uh, it will have some more uh, software enablements built around it. Uh, that would, that's an advantage for 1.3. Uh, the advantage for 2.0 is that it is the latest version. Some of the examples, like from these application notes, have actually got rolled into the KSDK 2.0. For example, the parallel camera interface. 1.3 didn't have a camera driver, but when you move to the 2.0, you have a Flex I.O. camera driver. So there's aspects of uh, we've taken some of these application notes and actually rolled the software into 2.0. So uh, I think um, you, you have to look at uh, what you're trying to get accomplished. So when you start tackling your Flex I.O. application, if you're starting from a known place uh, and that known place is uh, leverages SDK 1.3, then that, that will be your choice. But if you're starting from uh, generally from scratch or from uh, something that's already available in 2.0, then you should start with the 2.0. Great, got it. Um, let's go through uh, more questions. Let me uh, go down the list here. One second. Um, just another qu fast conclusion for uh, the Windows 10 questions. So if you do use Windows 10, you're saying you need to load uh, another bootloader with JLink? So uh, the time when you have to load another bootloader is when your board has become unresponsive. Even if you go back to a non-Windows 10 machine and your board is unresponsive, we have uh, narrowed down the root cause to the bootloader in the K20 uh, being corrupted. So that's the only time you need to load a new bootloader with a JLink light tool. Uh, what I highlighted as a, as a precautionary step uh, or as a step after you fix your bootloader issues is changing the debugger profile. So on that K20, there's two uh, there's two applications running on that K20. One is a bootloader and the other is the debugger profile. And so um, if you, you can change your debugger profile without facing any issues. This is some flexibility we built into the board because some IDEs uh, prefer CMSYS DAP, some IDEs prefer Sager JLink or even p and &E, uh, type tools. And so we have this option built into the board that you can out of you know when you get a freedom kd2f you can set the debugger profile and so uh, getting back to the question when when do I need to use a JLink light tool to reprogram the bootloader 
the, the time you need to do that is when your board has become unresponsive. If your board is still responsive uh, and you need to use Windows 10, then uh, follow the steps on slide 10 of this webinar uh, and uh, reprofile to remove uh, the CMSYS DAP debug profile to be a J-Link uh, type profile and, and this will avoid the, the corruption issues we, we've been seeing. Great. Cool. Um, another really good question. Uh, Somebody is trying to create a custom PCB that will plug into the uh, K82 and but it hasn't that person in particular, it's Emmanuel, he needs um, the board drawing with the position of the camera and 8-pin RF connector uh, relative to the board size in order to make that uh, custom uh, PCB connection. So again, it's uh, the board drawing with the position of the camera and 8-pin RF connector relative to board size. size. Okay, so uh, we post online our uh, design files and so um, I can follow up uh, after this uh, call with a, with a, a link, uh, but the design files, which are the, the ORCAD or uh, board files that are actually part of the physical design of the board are posted, and you can uh, do some measurement tools inside those, uh, those files. So uh, I think the best path for that question is, uh, looking at the, the design files that we have posted. If you go to nxp.com slash freedom dash kd2f, uh, there will be um, a tab in that website for um, downloads, and here you can download the, the board files, but I will also direct uh, the team with a, a, a direct, more direct link and instructions to get these. So, Definitely, uh, the board files are available. I, I, I uh, don't have the expertise to tell you if it's going to uh, give you all the drawings that you're expecting, but I do know that you can go into ORCAD uh, and do some point-to-point uh, uh, -point clicking and see the measurements there. So it, there, there may be some more uh, um, things you need to do once you get the design files, but I think the right place is the board design files, which we have posted on nxp.com. Great. So um, we'll get. Um, we'll make sure we'll follow up with everybody also with an email that points you back into all these resources on nxp.com. Um, there's another uh, again good question pertaining to people that develop on Linux machines. So some of the uh, again maybe all the answers it, but um, but some of the uh, app node software has source file with execution executable uh, extension .exe, uh, like uh, the an four nine five five sw. And is there a way to port it or any other way to get into that source file for people who use a Linux uh, machine or yeah. only uh, viewing it through Windows? Yeah, I uh, like I said before, I, I just I uh, <laughs> I'm not a, a Linux guy, so I have to admit that um, I, I know that we our tools are are compatible. We we do have Kinesis SDK uh, downloads for Linux. Uh, so uh, you can go, when you go and download Kness SDK, one of the options is to get it for uh, Linux machines, uh, but specific for the application notes, uh, I, I'm not sure what the, the challenge is in accessing those files, but I will highlight that we do have the Kness SDK downloads for Linux, so uh, definitely, um, like I said before, some of these app notes have actually been rolled into the KSDK 2.0. So maybe a better answer than what I gave before is uh, download the version of KSDK for uh, Linux and then see if some of these examples have been rolled into the KSDK 2.0. Got it. Okay. Great. Um, another question. Uh, is it possible to have a, a state machine with Flex.io SPI? Uh, and what are the limitations if, if it's possible? State machine depends on um, using shifters uh, that are uh, co-located. So uh, it, it is definitely possible, but the limitations are that uh, you have to have pins that are co-located. So this means uh, each of the 32 pins on the KD2 is labeled D0, D1, D2. So you have to use a, a, a number of pins that are co-located. They're, they're, 
they need to be grouped in, um, in nibbles. So there are uh, dependencies. Uh, I, I, I think the best way to answer the question would be a, a drawing, uh, but at a, a high level is um, in the reference manual, there's a section on uh, state machine. Uh, and also, if you look at this list that I'm showing right now, AN5239, emulating hardware state machine using FlexIO module, uh, let me see if I can click on this and, and uh, bring this up. Uh, there, there will be some guidelines in this application note as well, right? So uh, just to, to highlight some of the, these guidelines in here, uh, they, they, there are rules on which pins uh, can be used uh, and which shifters can be used. And uh, a great place to start would be um, the, uh, the application note that we have highlighted in this presentation. Awesome. Okay, a few more uh, good questions. Uh, how much, I, I guess, uh, this is from Jerry Farmer. I think uh, Jerry would try to say in chat if I got it wrong, how much power can you, uh, it says this, how much power from 3.3 volts on FlexIO connector, meaning how much maximum power can you draw uh, maybe on, uh, from the FlexIO connector? Yeah, I, I do not know uh, the answer to that, but um, I think that uh, the board will have a regulator for that power rail. So uh, for one, the board is USB powered. So uh, being USB powered, uh, the maximum is 500 milliamps, uh, but that's going to the 5 volt regulator. Uh, and so uh, you need to look at how the 3.3 volts is being generated. Uh, I guess it, it would be a, uh, an LDO. So uh, a rough estimate would be on the order of a uh, couple hundred. Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't want to put any numbers out there because I don't want anyone to, to damage their board. But I will say that the board is USB powered. Uh, and so this has a limitation. Uh, but my advice is to look at the board schematics, uh, look at the LDO that is generating the 3.3-volt uh, rail. This is the low dropout uh, regulator that w is taking in the 5 volts and generating 3.3. And the specification of that uh, tr uh, power regulator, it will uh, specify what its um, maximum current settings are. Uh, but um, at, at the 5 volt, it's, it's going to be uh, limited by your power source, which uh, generally is uh, 500 milliamps coming from a, a USB port. Great. Um, let me go for about five more questions. Uh, where is the Flex IO uh, J12 and RF header J22 on the PCB? Yeah, so this was uh, a question brought up about what, what types of boards can we connect to? So uh, there's third-party boards uh, out there that offer uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi connectivity, and they, they have uh, these preset header configurations. So whether it be through UART or through SPY, uh, we have these connectivity headers uh, on the board. So if there's the option of using Arduino shields, but there's the, also the option uh, of these headers that work with uh, partner boards. I shouldn't say partner, third-party boards uh, out there. So you can, uh, you can look at the schematic and see uh, what pins are connected there. Uh, and you can see that um, they're, they're SPY or UART. And then uh, I didn't have it prepared for this webinar, but we're, this is a good uh, time to highlight. We'll have a repeat on Wednesday, uh, and we'll have another Q&A session then. So uh, maybe uh, on Wednesday we can have uh, some of these questions readdressed, uh, pre pre pre-addressed uh, with the, with the answers, and we can come with a clear list of, of boards that plug into those RF headers. Great. So I'm going to go through the last three questions uh, a little faster, so we can finish uh, not too far out of uh, 7 a.m. here on the West Coast. Um, can pins or resources be changed on the Flex I.O. on the fly, and how? So um, 
MCUs in general, uh, specifically Kinetis MCUs, they have a, uh, a al alternate setting for every pin. And so on Kinetis MCUs, we have up to seven options on the pin. Uh, not always every option is a, a function, uh, but uh, at the, the GPIO level, uh, you can s set a pin to be an I squared C pin if I squared C is, is multiplex there, or just an input output pin or a flex IO pin. And so this is independent of the flex IO module itself. This is at the chip level. Uh, and so, yes, these settings can take place at the chip level and you can do it uh, on the fly. You have to understand what you're connecting to this pin and whether or not it can handle this. Uh, but definitely, uh, in general, all MCUs have uh, pin configuration settings that allow them to be uh, flexible uh, and, and to change the, the settings uh, on the fly. For, it, for the Flex IO, uh, talking about changing functions on the Flex IO, uh, because Flex IO depends on software, uh, it definitely can be done. I think that uh, it would require uh, uh, more software on the chip in order to do this, but um, there's the chip level settings that I overviewed with the, the pin muxing, but the Flex IO itself, uh, you can uh, on the fly change the, the software that's running and uh, change the software that's using pins to be uh, a spy uh, to software that's using pins to be UART, but uh, physically what you have connected there will could limit uh, what you are doing. but. If you had two K82s connected to one another, you could I could envision uh, software on both deciding, oh, I want these pins to be a UART now, and then you know changing the software on both chips to be SPY. Uh, but it would if you had Flex IO connected to Flex IO, that's an interesting uh, use case. But you could do some interesting things about changing the type of interface uh, and adding some some dynamic uh, configuration there. And maybe it would be a means of uh, securing your data in that, uh, you know, depending on a random number, you decide if you want to be a UR protocol, I squared C protocol, a SPI protocol, and each time you transfer data, you change. So you add some obscurity that way. Okay, great. I'll ask the last two questions, and for everybody else, and particularly I know Jerry and Manuel, you had a lot more questions, send me an email to Adam at hackster.io. That's Adam at hackster.io. And I'll make sure that I convey them to uh, Donnie uh, after this call. Uh, but let's go through the last two questions. So, um, get Manuel, uh, I have a uh, SDK 2.0 and I'm not seeing the processor expert for, KF, for the KF82 board. Is that correct? That's the first question uh, for Manuel. That's correct. So, uh, okay. maybe a, a, another uh, reason to use KSDK 1.3 is that the processor expert functionality is coming uh, in time. Uh, it may be called something else, but on the 2.0, it doesn't come pre-built pre uh, with processor expert. Great. And the last question, um, do I need an ORCAD uh, to read the TB files because it's, it's not free? And yeah. So uh, there's some free ORCAD viewers if you register with, uh, with uh, Allegro. So I think, uh, yeah, it, it, it's uh, not, not free, uh, I agree, but there's some uh, viewers that you can download. So if you uh, do a Google search on uh, ORCAD viewer, you can see. And there's some hosted sites where you can uh, load the, the board files and view on a, in HTML on a hosted site. So I understand, uh, yeah, not everybody has uh, thousands of dollars of tools. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> but uh, there, there are some free tools out there for board view viewers. Awesome. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for attending and asking a lot of really uh, insightful questions. Danny, as always, thanks for your time and um, really answering everything that people asked. And again, if you have any more questions, please do send them to me and I'll make sure that uh, we follow up with each one of you. Otherwise, we will publish the recording of this webinar and uh, make sure that the entire community takes advantage of it. And uh, keep having fun, keep developing, and reach out to me if you have any questions or any issues whatsoever. 
Thanks, everyone. Thank you.